Ken Van Dyne is a rock star, and because I'm impatient, I will just say that the name of this talk is Ubuntu Core Desktop, immutable, secure, reliable, and let him get to it. Ken. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, hope you're enjoying your time at scale so far, and definitely UbuCon, I know I am. Uh, it's, been a lot of, it's been a long time since I've been here. I think my last um, scale was 2007, uh, so before UbuCon started. So I'm, I'm excited to be here. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about Ubuntu Core Desktop. Um, uh, I'll apologize for anybody who's been to the Ubuntu Summit or watched the live stream. Part of this is a repeat of what I did at the Ubuntu Summit in Riga, um, but I have actually added a bunch of content. So a few of the slides I'll kind of skim past a little bit because you can watch that on the internet at your leisure, and this audience probably knows a fair bit about Ubuntu already. Um, so who uses Ubuntu? Um, you can probably guess, hopefully most of you use Ubuntu, uh, but gamers use Ubuntu, scientists, makers, artists, um, educators, IT professionals, there's a wide array of types of people who use Ubuntu, which is fantastic. Um, where do they use it? Uh, Ubuntu desktop is used all over the place. It's in manufacturing, in government offices. Um, you can find it in pretty much any sort of environment. Um, of course, Ubuntu, um, you know, our, our users tend to value certain things, things like privacy and performance, uh, security, uh, people are more aware of these sorts of things, our typical users. Um, you know, choice, of course. Um, these are some of the things we feel our users really value. And of course, this is what we're here to really talk about is Ubuntu Core Desktop. So, um, you know, but before we really dive into what Core Desktop really is, let's talk a little bit about what Ubuntu Core is. I'm sure many of you have heard of Ubuntu Core. It's usually thought of as something that's used for IoT devices and embedded environments and things like that. And yes, until now, that's primarily the types of places where Ubuntu Core has been used. Um, it's fully containerized Ubuntu, optimized for size, performance, and security. Basically, if you need something that runs in a small space, gonna be robust, reliable, guaranteed be up all the time. It's not going to break when it updates in the field, those sorts of things. You really want to be running Ubuntu Core. Um, you know, some of the primary benefits of Ubuntu Core um, is, of course, security and, you know, maintenance. You know, the software stack has got the longest support window out there. Um, uh, fully containerized separation between your applications and your kernel and everything. They're all installed. Essentially, they're all in their own little container. Every app gets installed is in its own container. Um, over there, updates utilize deltas and rollbacks, so it only downloads the bits that change, not the entire package every time it has to up, up, um, download. Um, rollbacks, um, if an update fails, it rolls back to the previous known good. Um, and it works in air cap environments as well. Um, and of course, the same kernel and libraries um, for your production and your development environment. So you can, you can be sure your application is going to work in the production environment. Um, and we can't talk about Ubuntu Core without really talking about snaps, right? I'm sure everybody's heard of snaps. Um, some controversy sometimes, you know, everybody loves that. Uh, but the, the primary gist of what a snap is, is a fully con uh, confined package that contains everything it needs to run, okay? So um, regardless of what environment you're running the snap in, like say Firefox, let's use that as an example. Firefox in Ubuntu is a snap. Um, if you test that Firefox version on say an Ubuntu 2204 device, you are sure to get the same experience out of that version of Firefox, that exact revision out of the snap store, on, say, an Ubuntu 18.04 device. Um, you don't need to test your applications on all the various host operating system versions that you may need that to run on. Um, you know that it's going to run because SnapD provides that level of support. Um, provides a lot of security built in, like uh, access to system resources, your camera. You know, it doesn't just have unfeathered access to all of these things, your microphone. You can, uh, you can turn those things off if you want. Um, you can prevent it having access to that. Um, you know this application that you just installed on the internet can't go scavenge things um, out of your address book, 
find all your contacts and email them all. They don't have access to that information. You have to explicitly tell it that you will allow access when it needs it. Um, and of course, you know, uh, the uh, package maintainers or the upstream software vendors, things like that, um, you know, they can keep very close eyes on when the snap needs to be published again to ensure you're getting all the CVE fixes because maybe your app depends on OpenSSL and there's an exploit in OpenSSL. Um, uh, the snap publisher can just rebuild their snap and automatically push out updates to the user, users and the version of SSL that's bundled in your snap is now patched. You don't have to worry about that sort of thing. Um, and of course, with the over there updates, um, the snap versions can move forward and backwards reliably. So if you update to a new version and for some reason it doesn't do something that you need it to do, um, you can roll back to the previous version. Um, you can install older versions and ensure that everything that is needed for that version to run still works. That's not always the case in classic Ubuntu where if you go download this deb of, of an older version of this application, um, maybe a dependency that it needed has changed. Um, and those things aren't all self-contained. So you're, you're subject to some instability there, or maybe it won't behave the way you would like. Um, uh, some of these snaps, you can actually control what channels things come from. So you could have like, um, uh, use LXD as an example. LXD publishes their versions in um, what's, what, what we call tracks. So if you want to track, say, the um, you know, 4.0 version of it, even though latest stables in the 5.0 series, you can just pin your device to only track updates from the 4.0 track. And as new uh, fixes for that stable release series goes out, you automatically get updates for that version, and you'll stay on 4.0. Um, you, know, you have a, that, that level of control, and you can pick and choose. Um, error handling and automatic recovery. Um, Snaps can, uh, it has this built-in mechanism for um, health checks. So um, as the publisher of the Snap, you can write some various scripts and things that get bundled in your Snap that says if these things don't return true, it's considered a failure. So if it fails a health check, that Snap update will automatically roll back to the previous revision. So as a user, your system is still working. Um, you know, so you can ensure that everything is the way you expect it to be. And of course, Delta updates, it only downloads the bits necessary, not the entire package, which is also great, especially in like uh, environments where you may have acts, um, like a 4G modem built into an IoT device. That sort of thing is very important. Um, so now onto Ubuntu Core Desktop. Um, this is our solution for a fully immutable, secure, and modular desktop operating system. So the idea here is we want to build on that same rock-solid um, Ubuntu core experience that we've spent the last decade creating, and we want to leverage that now in a desktop space where you may have the need for a really reliable, secure, robust environment, like say in your enterprise with uh, 10,000 machines and you know, maybe a call center or something where these machines have to be up and they have to always be working um, in a very managed environment. This is ideal. Um, and as I mentioned, we've been working on Ubuntu Core now for over 10 years, primarily targeting the IoT space. Um, we feel this is a great opportunity now to start building a desktop experience on top of that. Um, initially, you know, we're looking at like thin clients and enterprise type users really being very interested in this sort of thing, um, and um, probably some student users as well. You can very much think of this as like a Chromebook type experience. It's not quite as limiting as a Chromebook. You can actually install pretty much any Ubuntu software on it as long as it's available as a snap, um, but they run as native applications. It's not just web, you know, web type applications. But if you need an environment that's really reliable and secure, you'll get that. Um, so, you know, I talked a little bit about kind of what we're targeting now, but this is the progression of what the uh, spectrum of devices that Ubuntu Core has targeted. So, you know, we've kind of conquered the IoT space. We've been in kiosks for quite a while now. Things like digital signage, um, you know, those fancy digital ordering boards like in fast food restaurants and things like that. You know, those types of things are, you know, are sometimes running Ubuntu Core. Um, single purpose type devices, which is very much similar to the kiosk type experience. Um, but it doesn't have to be just like a browser. It could be a, per a device that just needs to be able to run this one application for managing a 3D printer or something, right? 
um, or in manufacturing type environments where it needs to be the management node that manages this thing in a plant floor. Plant floor. Um, those sorts of things are very commonly found with Ubuntu core. So now kind of the next step is going after like say thin clients, um, broad enterprise type deployments, which I'll talk a bit about in kind of the second half of this talk is kind of where we see this going. Um, we're not quite ready yet for the daily use, although I will say I'm using it daily. I am actually presenting this from Ubuntu core. Um, <laughs> so I, I do use this um, for most of my everyday needs. I, I will say I use a ThinkPad for a fair bit of my development work that I do. But when I'm on um, you know, video calls all day and things like that with colleagues and customers and partners and things, I'm usually on my Ubuntu core desktop machine. Um, and after we get to the point where we feel like it's really ready for daily use, then we'll start uh, tweaking the experience to, to make it more developer friendly. We already support things like uh, container workflows, so you can uh, actually install LXD on it, create containers, and inside of a container you can do anything you want. You could create a Fedora, Fedora container and do some RPM packaging if you want. That totally works. Um, so if you need to do those sorts of things, we're still going to polish that experience up a little bit to be a little bit better integrated with some like, you know, popular IDEs and things like that for this container-based development workflow. Um, but we're working towards that. Um, so a little bit about how it's built. So this is going to be a fair bit different than classic Ubuntu is what we're calling it these days. Um, uh, but, you know, since this is built on top of core, the, the concept behind core is a little bit different. Um, so everything is a snap. Um, you know, we have the kernel snap at the bottom. Uh, and we have this thing called a gadget snap, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, but this is effectively um, uh, providing some metadata about how the operating system image is going to look. Um, SnapD itself is a snap, and this is what manages all the snaps on the system and the resources and things like that. Um, then we have something called a boot base, and what this boot base is is effectively a minimal root file system that the operating system needs. And this minimal root file system is the thing that every snap has access to on the system. Um, read only, of course, but it can execute you know, like, you know, commands that are expected to be found in a root file system, those sorts of things. Um, and this is one of the very interesting parts is we actually have the Ubuntu desktop session as a snap. So we're running the entire GNOME desktop environment inside of a fully confined snap where it does not have unfeathered access to everything on your device. You could actually block access to, say, the camera. So GNOME couldn't access your camera if you wanted to. I don't know why you would actually want to, but you could do that. Um, but it is running inside of its own container. Um, an application not behaving well will not affect your desktop experience. Um, and then this concept of additional bases. So um, when a snap is built, uh, it has to declare what base it's designed to work with. And our bases are, we call them core snaps. So right now, core 22 is based on Ubuntu 22.04. We will soon have a core 24 based on 24.04. Um, but say you have a snap in the store that the you know, publisher, they're publishing new versions of their software, but they don't want to rebase it because maybe they depend on an old glibc from 18.04 or something. Um, they could define core 18 as their base. So that's fine, even though your system is running, say, 2404, that application is going to behave the same way that software developer wanted it to behave because it will have access to that version of glibc in core 18 because when that snap gets installed on the system, it will install core 18 as well. So we have the addition, additional bases there so we, we can provide uh, enough necessary components to run that software. And it doesn't affect the rest, rest of your system. So you can have two glibcs there, and it's fine. And then, of course, applications. So you know any sort of snap that you want to install, you can install on it. Um, you know, Firefox, Chromium, uh, Steam, you know, if you want to do some gaming, that, those sorts of things. Um, and a little bit about some of these. So like, for example, some use cases is it's really nice having the kernel as a snap. Um, imagine a day where we may have, say, a gaming optimized kernel that has some things tweaked that might not be as reliable for like a large scale enterprise type deployment, but it's definitely something you want for your, your particular workflow. Um, or maybe you need a real time kernel for some reason or those sorts of things. Uh, FIPS compliant, 
something like that. Um, you could actually switch channels um, for which version of the kernel you want to track um, reliably without worrying about having um, you know, an, uh, an environment that doesn't work on your system. You can just replace the kernel and you're good to go. Um, and back to what I mentioned there with the desktop session. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm going into more detail on this slide. Uh, but it's the same sort of thing. The idea is a flavor could, you know, like Lubuntu, could have their own desktop session snap that provides their experience um, on top of all these other components. So as a flavor, you don't need to replace all these other components. You just drop in a snap that provides your desktop session. Um, there could be a KDE one, Mate, those sorts of things. or Maybe you want a variation of the Ubuntu desktop session that is GNOME with most of the, the Ubuntu experience, but maybe you don't want the Ubuntu dock. Um, you could create your own snap that inherits all of our stuff and just overrides a few extensions that get loaded, that sort of thing. Um, and just drop that into the, the system and you're good to go. Oh, and imagine a day where perhaps uh, in our development series, like right now we're working on 2404, um, if we had a develop track of that Ubuntu desktop session where you have um, your entire operating system is super stable, the kernel is reliable, it's gonna support your hardware, all those sorts of things, but you just want that latest version of GNOME. And maybe, and we're not doing it yet, but maybe we're building daily builds of GNOME into an edge channel of a Devel track. You could switch your desktop session to use Devel Edge and live on that bleeding edge and get the newest version of GNOME, whether it's stable or not. Um, without tainting the rest of your system, without you know, relying on an unreliable kernel, those sorts of things. Um, that's totally possible. I'm hoping someday we will do something like that and then we'll effectively have a rolling release. If you're going to get to this later, okay. Um, the, the, the kernel snap, it, it should just be replaced with. So you can do, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so he was asking how reliable it is, like if you forget to switch your kernel, right? What happens? what happens? Well, I mean, it's possible that your kernel doesn't actually support your hardware, but you would know that right away, and actually you could do a snap rollback, and, or snap revert, and that revert will roll, uh, revert back to the previous known good one. So when you switch to that kernel, if it doesn't support all your hardware, you will know very quickly. And in most, most cases, it would probably fail actually to switch and automatically revert, roll back. Um, but as a user, if you notice a snap that you just updated or maybe you changed tra tracks, like in the kernel case, if you notice it's not doing what you want, there's a revert command that will revert that last change back to the known good. So you can very easily get back, even if your system's unstable, you can very easily get back. Um, um, you could, and it does keep multiple versions around, so you could easily have multiple kernels installed and very rapidly switch between them and just do a reboot um, if you want. So if you wanted to keep the kernel, one, the gaming one around and your everyday one around, you could actually make that change with just with a quick reboot um, as well. Um, there, there's, there's a thing built into Grub on Ubuntu Core for dealing with that sort of scenario. I'm not actually, I've never actually dealt with it, but there is an option in, if you bring up the Grub menu in Ubuntu Core, to do something like that. Okay. All right. Um, so what, does this, what, ma what makes this so exciting? Uh, so, you know, we all love Linux and open source and Ubuntu, of course. Um, and, you know, sometimes it doesn't always do exactly what we want. Sometimes we install somebody's software and it doesn't behave well. Um, um, and often we enjoy the tinkering part of it and making it work. But there's, many, there's oftentimes environments where that's not desirable, right? Stability is key. Um, keeping, you, you just need to use this computer to get work done. Um, so that's what makes this very exciting. Is this can be, you know, classic Ubuntu is not going away. Right? Um, this is an, an additional offering that will provide this level of reliability that's necessary 
for Ubuntu in many environments. Um, so things like, you know, system files just can't be randomly altered. Like you can't um, open up a terminal and sudo rm some important piece of that root file system because, in fact, that root file system is read-only. Um, and it's actually the file that you want to delete is not actually a single file. Um, it is actually contained inside of a squashfs file that is, happens to be mounted um, in that location. So you can't, you can't taint those kinds of things accidentally. Um, atomic updates that we talked about a little bit there, you know, I mean, uh, the fact that an, an update could potentially break something. The health checks and that automatic rollback is huge. Um, and of course, you know, running each application in its own confined environment, uh, you can trust that Spotify is going to work the way Spotify is supposed to work um, because it's been tested. We know it's going to work. You can install it on a Lubuntu core desktop, even though we've only tested it on you know, classic Ubuntu, you'll know that Snap's going to work. Um, we support things, and, and now Classic Ubuntu is getting this as well, which is exciting. Um, but like, for example, TPM-backed full disk encryption, um, uh, secure boot, things like that, you know, all stuff that Ubuntu Core has actually supported for many years now, um, our, our, our TPM-backed full disk encryption story in Classic Ubuntu is actually built all off of the Ubuntu Core um, full disk encryption um, story, which has been around for several years now. It's well proven already. Um, you can customize various elements, like I talked about a little bit, having maybe a different desktop session, things like that. You could easily like, decide, oh, I want to switch to KDE today. Um, you could easily make that switch. You could install that other snap, and you could have a KT environment and a GNOME environment installed without worrying about all those dependencies, because that KDE environment will have all of its own dependencies built in, and it will not conflict with the versions of you know, glib or whatever that you need in that GNOME environment. Um, and of course, you can, uh, in, in creating these desktop sessions, you could actually have something that's very locked down or trimmed down. Maybe you disable access to many things. Maybe you don't need the full dock and app spread in GNOME. You just need the ability for that user on this thin client workstation to be able to launch two apps. Um, you could provide, drop in a desktop session that only allows access to those two apps in a very controlled type environment. Um, manageability, um, one thing that's very key for this type of uh, deployment, like in a large enterprise, is knowing that your systems are all identical, right? Like you, you need to know what systems are potentially exposed to watch, what potential exploit, those sorts of things. You need reporting, those kinds of things. So in this case, you can trust that all of these systems are exactly the same. There isn't some random file that somebody's downloaded off the internet. They have sudo access on their system. They drop in a replacement to user bin ls. Um, that, that can't happen in this sort of environment, right? Uh, and of course, automatic and atomic updates. The systems generally automatically update. You can't actually turn off that automatic refresh these days. Um, but oftentimes, you do want that automatic update. But in an enterprise-type environment, you can actually gate when those updates go out to devices. But the devices can automatically update every four hours. And in that enterprise, you say, OK, I want to turn on this update for this package now. Those devices, in the next few hours, will all get them. Um, Snapped applications are only, only have access to things that they're permitted to. So you can really control those kinds of things. And in an enterprise type environment, you could actually control, like if you wanted to disable everybody's camera, you could remotely disable all the cameras on all those Ubuntu core devices inside of your enterprise if you want. Um, so I've mentioned enterprise a fair bit already. Uh, I'm going to dive in a little bit more detail on how we would envision an enterprise really rolling out something based on core desktop in a large-scale environment. Um, so, you know, back to this uh, diagram here that shows all the various components. Uh, the piece, it was on the other slides, but I didn't talk about it yet, the model assertion. Uh, this is effectively a map of all the components that go into building that operating system image, okay? 
Um, it's really just a JSON file. I'll show you an example of that here in a bit. Uh, but it's got some metadata about how you want to kind of construct this thing. And this is where you define the various snaps that need to be included. So here's a little snippet of that JSON that I talked about. Uh, I'm not going to really talk about most of the details there, but there's a few interesting, interesting things here. Um, one is um, uh, the grade is listed as signed. You could also do dangerous, which means not everything is necessarily has to be cryptographically signed in order to run. Um, but in this case, if you use signed, you do have to have a signed model assertion for the system to even boot. Um, you can specify the storage safety here. You notice in my example, I, I specified prefer encrypted. So in this sort of environment, when this machine, when this, this gets installed on a machine, if TPM, if a TPM is available to it, um, it will automatically use that TPM and automatically uh, use full disk encryption. Um, you can also require it as well. So it'll only It'll only install itself on machines that it can use the TPM for, um, or you can disable encryption completely if you would like. Um, and you specify what that base is here. In this case, it's Core 22 desktop. Um, and there's a stanza there, which I have dot, dot, dot in. This is where you list all the various snaps that go into it. And yes? I will cover that in a minute. Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll cover that, yeah. Um, so here's a little excerpt. This isn't, isn't a complete list of what I have in, in mind here, um, but this is how you define in that uh, JSON file which snaps to include. Um, so in this case, you know, not, I'm gonna get into the gadget here in a few minutes, um, but that first one is a gadget snap that may be, may be named UbuCon PC Desktop. Um, Type is gadget, and this has some metadata about how things are built, um, which kernel to use. So in this case, I'm choosing the kernel from the 2310 stable um, channel. Which desktop snap, Ubuntu desktop session from latest stable, um, which version of Firefox to include, and you can you could add any number of snaps that you may want to have there. Um, but you define all of these in the JSON file. Um, and then you sign that JSON file using a snap utility for signing it, which creates a signed YAML file, which um, can be trusted. Um, now we'll talk a little bit about the gadget. Um, so this is some Ubuntu core terminology that I think a lot of people aren't familiar with. Uh, but effectively, what the gadget does is defines various information about what the operating system image needs to look like. So, for example, the storage layout, what the file systems may be necessary. Maybe you need to create three or four file systems for some particular workload or something like that. You can define that in the gadget. You can also define things like, and I'll, I think the next slide actually covers it. Um, this is a little snippet of what it looks like. It's a YAML um, format. Um, but if you see the section there where it says defaults, um, this is where you set various settings um, that need to be uh, honored throughout your device. So um, we have a couple experimental things enabled here because uh, you know some of these things are still experimental in Core Desktop. Um, but you see the refresh retain value there of two. That tells the system to keep two copies of every snap installed. You can set that to three, four, five, and it'll keep that many, it just it uses more disk space. Um, but if it keeps multiples around, you can very quickly and easily switch between them without having to download new revisions and stuff like that. Um, oftentimes, it's just a quick restart of the application or um, a reboot in the case of a couple special snaps. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about landscape in a few minutes, but landscape is a fleet management you know, solution that can manage large-scale deployments of these machines. Uh, this is an example of an Ubuntu core device being able to auto-enroll in landscape. So you can imagine a fleet of you know, 10,000 machines inside of an enterprise. They all get booted up for the first time. When they get booted up, instead of having to go and physically sit at the machine, and put in things like the URL to how to find the landscape server or a registration key to allow it to register with that, um, those sorts of things. 
you know, you would traditionally have to do that sort of thing manually with this Ubuntu core type solution. The machines will actually auto enroll in that landscape instance. So they will just start, as they boot up, they'll start being populated in landscape so you can manage those machines remotely. So those are really just settings on the snap that's provided. So in this case, landscape client is a snap which provides an agent on the device to allow it to manage it. Um, and then these are snap settings that get set by the snap uh, automatically when it gets installed on the system. Um, and then we have, a, it's a relatively new tool called Ubuntu Image. Um, this is our kind of next generation way of building Ubuntu images. I'm looking forward to the day where we can use this to build our classic ISOs, because I'm sure, Simon, you're well aware of how much fun that is. Um, uh, Ubuntu Image is much more modern. Um, it takes a declarative type input and outputs a bootable operating system image. Um, so in this case, it takes as input that signed model assertion that I talked about, and it outputs a, an operating system image that can be booted up on the system. Maybe it auto installs itself, or maybe it provides you a guided install, um, any number of ways that it can actually be installed on the system, but it'll create that image. Um, Ubuntu images have been used now for a long time for building Ubuntu core images. It supports it well, supports it well for core desktop. Um, we're not quite there yet to use Ubuntu image for classic, but we are getting close. I'm looking forward to that. Um, but that's how we actually produce an asset that can be used in the field to actually install it on somebody's system. Um, now, this is where I was mentioned landscape a few minutes ago. Um, landscape is just for large scale systems management, right? If you have a fleet of machines um, and you need to be able to create reports on them, you know, you need to know what what, what your exposure is to some particular bug. Like you know, um, you know, Firefox version X or whatever has some sort of a uh, CVE against it. Um, you need to know which devices in your organization has that version of Firefox. Um, you know, you have a lot of control over that automatically by you know, being based on Ubuntu core and the snaps and things automatically updating, things like that. But in landscape, you can actually, you know, create reports. You can actually see, get some visibility on exactly what's installed on, on your systems. And you can actually control that too. You can, maybe you can say, I want to update these, you know, 100 machines to this new version of something and see how it goes first. You could actually control that sort of thing. Um, you know, uh, pushing out, uh, rollout security fixes, and things like that. Um, this landscape has been used for a long time already on classic Ubuntu, so all of these things were available with existing classic Ubuntu. It's recently gained support for Ubuntu Core. Um, but we see, you know, in an enterprise type scenario with Core Desktop, you know, landscape being a critical component there. Um, and you can automate any sort of thing. You can create you know, automated monitoring graphs, all kinds of things for the devices in the field. Um, so you can manage you know, software on the devices, um, services that may be running. So maybe you need to find out if the devices you know, in your enterprise have this particular service running or not, because at the time that you built it, you weren't really thinking about it. Um, um, but now you've, once, you, once you realize this could potentially be an issue, you could scan the devices in your um, enterprise and find which devices may be running that service. And you can remotely disable it if you, if you need to, or enable it even. Um, you can remotely manage the user accounts on the system. So uh, like if you need to you know, create a, an account for some new software or something that's going to be installed on the system, or um, maybe provisioning you know, a machine that's now being reused for this new person, you could create a new local account. Um, or you could even manage things like Active Directory type integration, you know, like allowing access to enroll in a domain, things like that. Um, of course, viewing the device state, what state the machines are in, um, which ones are up now, what are their current uptime, um, resource utilizations, you know, are the machines running low on memory? You can see all those sorts of things. Um, and of course, access to logs, you know, being able to capture logs to debug problems on a particular machine. Maybe a user is having trouble and they've called the help desk and um, you know, submitted a ticket. You could remotely pull system logs from it via landscape. Um, that's it. Questions? I'm sure there's plenty. Simon. I have um, one question for you. So, all of these are really great ideas. I love them. 
And the, the one piece of constructive criticism I keep hearing, or criticism regardless, whether it's constructive or not, over and over is the, the Snap Store is proprietary and so is Landscape. What do you do to speak to those people who, who have those concerns? What would you say to them? Um, well, yes. So um, the Snap Store, the back end to the store itself, yes, it is proprietary. Everything that runs on the systems that actually get deployed in the field is all open source. Um, I can't speak to whether or not any of that may change in the future. Um, but yes, the back end is proprietary. That question's been asked on Reddit like a million times. Um, uh, I am not necessarily qualified to answer that, but um, I you know, will assure you everything that actually gets deployed on anybody's device is 100% open source. Um, and um, we well documented the API to the store. It would be easy for, well, easy. It could be completely replicated if somebody wanted to create a store that functioned the exact same way. Um, and we actually did see that happen, and I'm very glad that it did. On the Click Store, which was the predecessor to the Snap Store, um, there's an open store that got taken over by UbiPorts um, that basically was developed to that spec that we had for our store. And that is still running today for the UbiPorts uh, project. Um, so it, it's been done before. Somebody has created an alternative store. You know, it could happen for the Snap Store as well. Uh, yeah, earlier, and um, you, you may have actually explained this, and I just didn't didn't quite hear it. But um, earlier, you mentioned um, I think it was on the manageability slide about how user with sudo can't just like download a random version of ls that does something totally differently. I was just curious what the enforcement mechanism for that specifically was. Is that like is that through Snap or is that through App Armor or so like how does that get enforced yeah. that it's going to only run that? So well, Snaps do heavily rely on app armor, but in that particular case, um, like if you're trying to uh, drop in a user bin ls, right, in that directory path, um, that file system is read-only. You can't put a file there and replace the existing one because it's read-only. Um, so all of those sorts of things are read-only. Um, it's completely immutable. Um, if you did for some, you know, somehow drop something in a location where something could try to execute something, actually the snap would fail to launch um, because the signature doesn't match anymore. So um, a snap itself is actually a single SquashFS file, which is basically in a, a single file that can be mounted um, in a location and it like provides a file system. Um, but it's a single file and if the signature ever changes on that SquashFS, so at runtime, it mounts that SquashFS file into something that can be executed. The, the files inside of it can be executed. Snap, snap won't even launch the snap if the signature doesn't match. So like if you try to um, unsquashFS Firefox, tweak something, resquash it, and you know, coerce your system somehow to try to launch it, it would still fail to launch because the signature of that SquashFS wouldn't match. Um, so you can really trust that those bits are what they say they are. Any other questions? Uh, if I have a software package that's only currently available as a deb, for example, what would need to happen to run that on Ubuntu Core? Um, so in, in the current scenario, the, your best bet would be to create a container and run it inside the container. Um, so you could create an LXD container of, say, 2204, install the deb there and launch it and it will work just fine. And in that case, it's unconfined, but inside that container. So everything inside that LXD container is kind of its own, um, you know, segregated from the rest of the system that way. You could do that. Um, the better alternative would be to repack that deb as a snap and contribute to the ecosystem. Uh, what about um, software that, say, has kernel modules and other stuff like uh, NVIDIA drivers? Yes. So, um, so actually right now, that PC kernel um, snap does include um, uh, the NVIDIA drivers. Um, however, that's uh, something that's being split out, and you'll be able to install um, those sorts of things as separate snaps. So like the NVIDIA driver could be a separate snap, and you can be assured that that version of that snap matches this kernel 
and they will be updated in lockstep. Um, so uh, that's, the terminology has changed several times. I think it's currently called um, components, snap components is the terminology for that. Um, and that's coming very soon. Um, but then you could have these sorts of drivers packaged as snaps and they will match. So things like DKMS though, for example, are not gonna work, which is where it would compile the module source at basically runtime, right? So, um, but in that case, you're actually tainting your system when you use DKMS because any random thing could be um, very untrusted and now it's in your kernel space, right? Um, so those sorts of things aren't gonna work in this sort of environment, but I would argue they probably shouldn't. Um, let's get them properly snapped in a trusted type of environment, published, vetted, uh, and then manageable. So you don't suddenly have a kernel that doesn't support this anymore. Heather over here has a question. Oh, you got one back there? Sorry. Two questions, uh, real quick. Uh, you've got uh, the Ubuntu core. Uh, what do you expect to be the default applications and how do you expect that process to work? And two, if I download it today, what's broken? <laughs> what's broken? <laughs> um, okay, so if you I'll start with that question. If you download it today, what's broken? I would say not much. I mean, things like, you know, um, I use my Bluetooth headset daily with it. Um, those sorts of things work. Um, uh, you know, it will boot, it will run most things that you want it to run. Um, you know, there is some quirks here and there, like, you know, the telegram snap, annoyingly, the app indicator doesn't pop up and I haven't really debugged that yet. Little things like that, that you would expect to work, you know, um, uh, may not, but for the most part, it does work. Like I said, I use it, you know, probably two thirds of my day every day and I have for like a year. Um, it's pretty reliable. Um, there is some scenarios where something that you want you know, may not work because it is running in a fully confined type of environment and not all apps were designed to play that way. Um, but it, it does work. And what was the other half of your question? I'm sorry. Default applications. Default applications. Um, so this is where every deployment will be a little bit different, but the ones that I've defined in our kind of our current reference build are um, uh, Firefox for the browser, um, GNOME text editor, um, we have the, you know, cup snaps, which I think is, I guess, more infrastructure related stuff. Network manager as a snap, um, GNOME logs, so you can get, you know, log information easily without actually going to a terminal. Um, you don't get quite the same terminal experience because you don't have a, um, you know, same level of access to your system, but we do have a temporary kind of solution called console, if you are in install today, um, uh, that does give you some access. Uh, but having something like GNOME logs is handy. Um, GNOME system monitor is included. Um, and a few other random things like GNOME weather, a couple of GNOME apps like that. Not a lot, it's pretty light. Oh. Yeah, I'll, I'll summarize. So the first one is a question about debug symbols and snaps. Okay, that's a more complicated question, but I'll, I'll try to speak to that. Callahan may know more than me. Uh, but anyway, the second half of that though, I mean, we haven't really completely defined what like a community release is gonna look like for the, what the default apps are. Um, I would imagine it probably would be beneficial for us to do something similar to what we do with Classic where we have a minimal and, um, uh, well, I guess, 
full. I, we switched it because the default used to be the full. But anyway, so we may do something like that where we have two builds that include those things, but also, you know, App Center is included. You can easily install LibreOffice if you want it, you know. So the question is, is there a lot of value including it or not? It's pretty trivial for us to add it, to have a, you know, just a JSON file we could drop in. We could have two different images built. So we haven't really talked about that yet. I mean, it's still kind of a reference implementation, but that would, that would be easy to do. Uh, the debug symbols question is a very good one. Um, Mozilla's done their own thing with Firefox, which is working out pretty well, but a lot of it does rely on their infrastructure. Um, we've got some work happening now. Do you want to speak to this, Callahan, or is he? Okay. Oh, he doesn't have the microphone, though. Um, try to be loud, I guess. He's got it. Okay, I'll, I'll do my best. Okay, I'll try to summarize that. So really the solution for that is very similar to what I talked about with the kernel drivers being components. It's a new, um, new concept in Snaps is where you can build these components. So um, as, a as a developer, you can create the debug symbols and they'll be, repackaged in the, they'll be packaged in the component portion of that. And then to actually utilize those, you just download those components. Um, what about a uh, debug symbol server sort of solution? Are we gonna use debug info D or whatever that's called? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah. The, the, first, the first bit of that is actually getting the debug symbols into the snap. So, um, yeah, that's been a, a long road to get there for the debug symbols, but I'm, I'm glad we're, we finally have a path there. So, uh, more questions? We got a couple back here. I'll try to. Um, well, I mean, so, uh, yeah, okay, what's the difference between uh, uh, the benefits of Ubuntu Core versus some of the other immutable kind of offerings? Um, yeah, I would say the modularity is probably the, the biggest thing, and I mean, and also really leveraging all the, Snap's been around for a really long time, and there's so many benefits built in to just, you know, using your applications as Snaps your operating system effectively leveraging all those sorts of things. There's a lot of benefits there that those other immutable systems do not offer. Um, but I also say the modularity, I think, is very compelling because, you know, generally with those, some of those other immutable offerings are there is a giant, you know, like say RPM OS tree that is one big chunk. And if you need to say install the NVIDIA drivers, you have to replace that big piece with another big piece that has the NVIDIA drivers installed, or say you need to work, run some particular container workflow or something like that, that actually needs to be part of that. Um, uh, you know, in our case, you could just install um, LXD or Docker as a snap, and it just works. You don't have to replace the root operating system effectively to make that work. You could just drop in the component that you want, and your workloads will work. Um, so we have that modularity that the others really don't. Um, you know, we've been working on this for a really long time. I mean, Snaps have been around for, you know, a very long time now, longer than Flatpak. Um, uh, we've built up a lot of technology here over the years. We started with, you know, focusing a lot of our efforts on IoT and those sorts of things. But in doing so, we've really built up kind of a portfolio of just great technologies. And it's all coming together now to really provide enough to run a desktop on. Um, so it's taken us a while to get there, but I think you know, the ability to have all those sorts of components and the way they interact together, uh, I think is really the, the differentiator. I think you had a question too? Oh, same? Okay. Any more? Yeah.
Okay, so yes, um, I, I will say, um, well, I guess it's not important now, we're done. Um, the, the, the real limiting factor is, so I, I mentioned, for example, that our GNOME desktop session is actually running inside of a strictly confined snap itself, right? So something like, say, a terminal that you launched inside of that, unless we had a fully snapped terminal that had all kinds of special privileges, um, but theoretically, if you launched a terminal inside that, it would actually be running as if it's inside that same sandbox that the GNOME desktop session is running in. So it wouldn't have access to anything else on the system besides the things that that GNOME session is using. So the, the scope of the terminal will be, you know, predicted based on the environment that it's running in. So there's a few different ways we could solve this. Like, for example, we could snap some popular terminal applications and create some SnapD interfaces that allow some special access to make it behave more like a classic system. Um, uh, I mean, we could certainly do that. I don't know if we will. Um, I think the more compelling thing is to really harness containers. And if you need to run scripts and do things for your work that requires those sorts of things, you just open up, a, and we have a very nice um, uh, app called, it's still experimental, but it's called Workshops, which is a terminal experience built on top of LXD, um, where you could say, you know, with a click of a button, you have a Fedora container up and running, you have a terminal experience inside that Fedora container where you can run any sort of scripts you want, it feels just like any other terminal, you're just inside of that container. Um, you know, there's some other fun ones in the community, you know, we have a fun contributor, has got LXD terminal, I see you, Ted. <laughs> um, yeah, he created a snap of LXD terminal, um, which does a similar sort of thing. Um, but so we, we could have those sorts of things, but I really think the future there is leveraging containers more on the desktop to give you that developer experience where you need the powers to run any sort of thing you need to run. You can do that inside of your container without affecting the rest of your system. Like I said, it's not necessarily for tinkerers. If you like tinkering with your operating system that's running on your host system, it may not be the right solution. The reason I'm curious is you mentioned students. Mm -hmm. And it, it sounds to me, to Chrome, but it's like students strictly means students who are enrolled in the program. Like, this is not high school students. Yeah. Well, but again, can't container workflows, right? Like you can imagine. Um, uh, Visual Studio Code um, that's running on your system that has, you know, compiling stuff or whatever it needs to do inside of these containers. Um, you could have a, you know, web development going on inside of a container and accessing it from the browser on your host. Um, so you can do that sort of thing in a container without tainting the reliability of your system. You know, um, I think it's a I think that's the direction we really need to be looking in. But again, some of those questions aren't completely answered, um, which is you know, one of the reasons why I want to you know, gather feedback from more folks, right? To see what concerns people have. Um, and that's why we're not saying we're releasing it for developers yet. You know, we're working our way there. The things, the problems that we know we can solve well, um, and then get it to the tinkerers later on. Um, you, uh, okay, uh, how ready is this for somebody who may want to package a different desktop? Um, I will say you could certainly do it now. You may need to ping a few of us for some pointers, um, but I am happy to be that person if you want to try to package a different desktop. Um, because so, so far we've only done GNOME, um, but I would really love to have at least one other reference to prove that it works. So which desktop are you thinking? <laughs> okay, let's definitely talk about that. Let's definitely talk about that. Um, I suspect yours will be easier. <laughs> He's got an unfair advantage. Um, all right, uh, any last questions? Well, I'm sorry, uh, repeat again? So would the PH recommended use case be like to introduce the actual shell, the protocol, with the PH system? To change the shell? Yeah, like from Bash to Fish. 
Oh, oh, doing that sort of thing? Yeah, so that, that's uh, another one of those things where the terminal would need to provide the shell that you want. So like if you want fish instead of bash, I will say our current images we're building do not have fish. Um, and they're probably not going to because some of that comes from that base OS, the root file system there that's as a snap. Um, but you could absolutely have your own terminal app packaged with fish included. Um, or, again, back to the containers, um, spin up a container, app get install fish, and you're done. Um, and when these containers are created, like you can map in your G access to your GPU, your home, uh, your home folder, all those sorts of things can be mapped directly into um, your container so it feels at home. Uh, that's what I do today, my, all my containers are, so. Eggy. Yeah. Heroic and whatnot. We started working on a new project called UL.UGL. And that leverages the same thing that Steam does in terms of using the Steam Linux runtime with pressure vessel, which we've seen a lot of members of VRAP and did use for VRAP. How has there been any uh, progress in terms of running a container inside a container is basically what I'm asking. Okay, so any progress on running a container inside a container, his, his reference case here is like what we do today with Steam, right? So Steam downloads a pressure vessel runtime and it basically creates its own container. In our case, we're running Steam in a snap, so it creates its own container inside of that. You have another use case that's very similar. Um, you know, as a generic kind of case, that's complicated. Like we've had to do some special stuff in SnapD to make all the pressure vessel stuff work. Um, I would argue we probably could make the Steam support interface a little bit more generic and make that work for what you're doing as well. So we're basically doing the exact same thing that they're doing in terms of trying to get things to run the same across different platforms. Yeah. So literally pulling their, their run time. Yeah, so precisely. I think, I mean, maybe what we should do is actually look to make a more generic, not, not call it Steam, you know, um, type of interface that allows all of that stuff that's necessary for pressure vessel, and then it could be reused for snaps that are leveraging your framework. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, I'm here today and tomorrow, let's chat. Um, uh, I think it would be very compelling. So I'd love to, love to hear more about that. So. All right, I think we're out of time. Thank you all, I appreciate it. Um, hope you enjoy the rest of UbuCon and enjoy your lunch. <laughs>